taken note, uh, we are in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to finish up chapter 16, and we're not going to make it through 17, but we're going to look at the transfiguration. So we'll be going to chapter 17, uh, verse 8. And uh, this morning, if you're taking note, the title to the message is, It's All About the Cross. It's all about the cross. The, the, the life of Jesus, you're going to see this morning in the text, the life of Jesus Christ, what his life was about. Though he did many miracles, he healed the sick, he taught people about the kingdom, but the purpose of Jesus' life, the purpose of his coming to this earth, was really singular. And, you know, we're going to look at what the purpose of Jesus' life is. As we do this morning, we're going to talk about, you know, what's the purpose for our life? What has God called us to as believers in Jesus? So, our Bible should be open, Matthew chapter 16. It's all about the cross. Let's settle our hearts. Let's pray together. And we're going to ask the Lord just to, to really bless our time today together in His Word. Father, Lord, we delight... Any time, Lord, we get to hear your word. God, we love to hear your word, and we love to hear your word for us, Lord. Lord Jesus, sometimes in the morning, Lord, we, we open our Bibles, we hear you. Sometimes it's in our daily reading. Lord, a truth comes up, and it's, it's an arrow from you, Lord, right to our hearts. Lord, like water, day by day, your word to us causes the, the parched ground of our soul, Lord, to, to Lord, uh, come back to life. Lord, oftentimes we hear from you in settings like this, Lord, when we're gathered as a church body. Lord, we have, and we've come together, Lord, during this time in this unique way for the purpose of worshiping you, Lord, for the purpose of seeing the, the, the prayers of the saints continuing to, to rise up. Lord, into the courts of heaven to see you answer these prayers, to see lives changed. And Lord, often we hear from you in Bible study as we come to listen to your voice today. God, we submit ourselves during this time to the word of God. And you speak to us that way, Lord. And today, Father, give us fresh direction, we pray. Answering questions today, Lord, confirming ideas you've placed in our hearts and leading us, Lord, on this journey. And we ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen. This past week, I uh, was reading this article about this new, new alarm clock. And I don't know about you, I hope that this coronavirus pandemic hasn't completely thrown you off, right, from your routines. You know, just because there's a coronavirus pandemic and just because you can't get up and go to church on Sunday or Wednesday night if you come, doesn't mean we should change the good things God has put in our life. But I read about this uh, new alarm clock. It was in an article I was reading about how Christians around the nation are struggling to keep their consistencies, right? Just those, those things, those habits that we had that were good. And they said this new alarm clock, it's called Awaken to Bacon, I thought. I have to buy one of these, right? Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to know how it works, so I looked into it, and you actually put a piece of bacon in it before you go to bed. Uh, then you set the wake-up time, and in the morning, at just the right time. I mean, just imagine. This is like possibly what heaven is going to be like. At just the right time, it cooks it to wake you up to the smell of bacon. I mean, could anything better? Now, I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, do they have a vegetarian option, Right? Like maybe you're a vegetarian, you put the broccoli in there, but that's why no one should be a vegetarian, right? Because there's no option for this. I'm just kidding. But this morning, you know, Jesus is going to talk to us. If we could turn the monitor down or what have you, it's a little high in here for me. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about how it's all about the cross. It's all about the cross of Jesus Christ. It's all about what he's, maybe too much now, uh, you know, uh, it's all about the cross of Jesus. It's all about what he has done for us. And we're going to see this. There's a quote I love. It's by a man, uh, an old theologian. He says, the Bible, uh, it says, cut the Bible anywhere and it bleeds. Anywhere. What does that mean? It means that throughout this book, 
Throughout this book, there is a thread that goes through the entire scripture, really that is pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. And not just pointing to the person of Jesus, but to the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're taking note, you could jot it down. A couple places in Scripture where we see this. First is right there in Genesis, right, with Father Abraham himself. Uh, Father, I, I can't, now it's too low, to be honest. Uh, right there in Genesis, Abraham, you know, God had told him to take his son Isaac and bring him up on a mountain. Uh, he told him that, I'm going to call you to sacrifice your son, to see, are you willing to let go of the promise that I've made to you? Right. Isaac wasn't Abraham's idea. Isaac was God's idea. But he said, I want you to sacrifice him for me. And Abraham went through with that. But when he got there, and it's interesting in that text, that is the first place in the Bible we see the word love appears, right? And we see Abraham is willing to sacrifice his only son, in this way, just like God. We see this picture of Jesus right there in Genesis. You flip to the right in your Bible to the book of Exodus, we see the same thing. We see there Moses, the children of Israel, on their way out of Egypt, set free from Egyptian slavery. And what happens? They begin to complain. They begin to gripe. What has God done? Serpents come, start biting them. And God tells Moses, I want you to lift up, you know, I want you to make a bronze serpent I want you to lift it up, and whoever would look at that bronze serpent would be made well. Would be made well. And that was a picture of Jesus. If you're sick, look to the Lord Jesus. You'll be healed. You'll be made well. And then Psalm 22, right there in the middle of your Bible, we see King David writing a psalm about being crucified. It's a prophetic picture pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ. All these Old Testament scriptures are pointing to Jesus going to the cross. And then the mega scripture. For you folks that are familiar with the scriptures, the one that points to Jesus in the Old Testament more than any other, we know it, it's Isaiah 53, right? That entire chapter, as a, you know, it's, it's amazing what the prophet there says, pointing to the person of Jesus. I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It's Jesus. The whole chapter, the whole Old Testament scripture points to the person of Jesus Christ. And this thread, church, listen, this thread goes throughout all of scripture, all through the Old Testament until we get to the person of Jesus. Now, you may not have noticed this, but when you actually read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you'll discover is a third of everything that they say in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually happens in the last week of Jesus' life. You know, we don't really, other, you know, the movies try to show us, but we don't really know what happened in Jesus' childhood. The scriptures don't tell us about that because that wasn't the purpose of his life. The purpose of Jesus' life was that last week leading up to this one great event. And if you're taking note, maybe jot this down, understand this. The cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest event of history. The cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest event of history. You know, it was the priority of priorities on Jesus' to-do list. It was the top. It was the thing that Jesus knew, I am going to do this this is what I'm here to do. Now listen, to nail this down, to understand this, not only does Genesis, Exodus, we could really legitimately, and we're not going to do it for the sake of time today, we could go through every single book of the Bible, all 66 books, and point out how every one of these scriptures, like the old theologian said, if you cut the Bible, it bleeds with the blood of Jesus. Everything is pointing to one singular event. And even the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, if you're taking note, jot it down, Revelation 13, verse 8, it says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the very foundation of the world. Listen, if you want to know the mind and the heart of God, if you want to know what he has been planning before he spoke and he said, let there be light, he was planning the redemption of humanity. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now today, Matthew 16, 
we will begin with Jesus speaking directly about the cross. And I love this about Jesus. When he speaks to his disciples about the cross, he's talking directly to them. He doesn't mince his words. He's not going to give them a parable. He's going to tell them exactly what he's thinking here. And it's interesting because today in the church, there's this tendency because, you know, the blood, talking about blood and the brutality of the cross, it's not a message that, that makes people feel warm and fuzzy. We tend to try to steer around that. But the Bible is actually pointing to it. It's calling us to, to realize this is where it happened, man. This is where heaven was opened for you and I to be saved, for us to go to heaven. So this morning, we're going to see Jesus leading us right into that. It's all about the cross. So our Bible should be open. Matthew 16, we pick it up in verse 21. It says here, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples. If you have your pen, you could circle that word show. It, it, it literally means is he's opening the eyes. Right? You, you know with Jesus, he could literally take it, he could show it to the disciples, and Peter would look right at it and totally miss it. And you're going to see that happen in the text here as well. He began to show to his disciples that he must, if you have your pen circle that, he must. Listen, when Jesus had to do something, he was going to do it. This, was, this is what his purpose was. He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things. If you have your pen, put a little one next to this, because you're going to see Peter's going to miss this. Suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes. Number two, next to this, be killed. He's going to be killed. But then Jesus says, and be raised the third day. Put a number three next to that so you understand it. You don't miss it like Peter did. Verse 22, then Peter, look at this. Peter, it says, takes him aside and began to rebuke him. He begins to rebuke him. And what does he say? Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you, right? Peter says this to Jesus, as if Peter has the authority to say this to Jesus. We're talking today about how it's all about the cross. If you're taking note, the first thing we're going to see here in Scripture, number one, is you need to listen closely to everything Jesus says. Listen closely to everything Jesus says. Don't come up short. Here we see Jesus is opening their eyes to the reality of how things, how things were going to go. And can I tell you this? This isn't the, the last time Jesus is going to look his disciples in the eyes and say, listen, guys, I'm going to be crucified. They're going to kill me, but then I'm going to rise from the dead. That's why the Bible says here he began to show them. Listen, it takes us time to really get it. And you know who doesn't understand that? Before I tell you who doesn't understand that, I'm going to tell you who does understand it. The one who does understand it is Jesus. God understands that. He knows it takes time. He knows he's going to have to say to us the same thing. He's going to have to say, love your neighbor. And you say, now Lord, what exactly does that mean? Lord, I'm sensing as you say that to me, you actually want me to go out and buy a new flat screen TV. He's going, mm, not what I said. He's going to say it, love your neighbor. Lord, this is how it works. It worked like this with the disciples. Jesus began. We have trouble realizing it takes time, but God doesn't. God knows that it's going to take time for you and me to really get this, to, to walk with him, to follow him, to do what we're supposed to do, to begin to realize as much as we want to do the big things, Jesus is going to speak to us about the little things. And as we do the little things, what happens is we walk right into the big things. We walk right into them. We walk right into them. You know, you look at Paul the Apostle in the book of Acts. At the end of his life, at the end of the book of Acts, he ends up getting to go to Rome and share the gospel with Herod and the, and the emperor and all these things. But how did that happen? Was it Paul strategized the plan on how to get there? No. He was actually taken prisoner on a slave ship. And if you know the story, there was a few unplanned stops along the way. Shipwrecks. They, he went from being the, you know, God was mad at him because a snake bit him to he was a God, you know, and through it all, Paul kept a servant's heart, his eyes on Jesus and kept pro just faithfully proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. You see, Peter here struggled with this. Listen, God knows it takes us time more than we do. Um, with this beautiful weather outside and this coronavirus season, my family and I, we've been taking these uh, bike rides 
But sometimes the bike ride is long and one of the kids will uh, not be able to make it back. It's not me. It's not me, but it gives me an excuse to have to slow down. My wife will just zoom ahead. She's like a professional bike rider or something. You know? And I'll stay back with one of them. And if they get too tired, we'll start walking the bikes. And I have set my daughter on the back of the bike. And she loves to get out. And we start walking the bike. But what I found interesting was as we're walking the bike, she actually, I get her off of her seat. I put her on the ground. She actually has to run. So we're walking the bike and she's jogging. You know, and she's just got a big smile on her face. And that's just what it is. As I'm walking, she's running. You know, sometimes church, that's what it takes. You know, we want to follow Jesus. And sometimes we got to actually break a little jog out. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean God is in a rush or God is out of control. But it's because God is walking. God is moving. And when God is moving, it usually means we got to run a little bit. We got to pursue him. We got to... We got to seek him. We got to be diligent, right? And Peter here, it tells us that he takes Jesus aside after Jesus tells him about the cross and he begins to rebuke him. You know, notice here, if you're confused about this, this is an objection, right? Peter is not on board with the plans that Jesus is setting out. And it's almost like a lawyer in a courtroom says, Your Honor, I object. Really? And then the lawyer says, May I approach the bench? Okay. And that's kind of what we have here. Peter approaches the bench and he tells Jesus, listen, you, you don't have to go through this. <laughs> I don't know if you know who I am. I'm a pretty big guy. Church history tells us Peter was a massive, massive fella, you know, for those days. And he says, they're, they're not, I'm not going to let you go to the cross. I've got this other plan in place. We're going to see what happens here. And I think Peter did what many of us do. We don't listen closely to the whole statement. See, Peter listened closely to point one and point two. He listened closely to Jesus when he says, I'm going to have to suffer and I'm going to be killed. But then he kind of already started to formulate his thoughts. Right? As Jesus was talking, Peter stopped listening. He's like, all right, all right, I know where you're going with this. Let me get my rebuttal. Okay, here's how I'm going to say it. Blah, blah, blah. And as he did that, what happened? He missed the point. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be killed because I'm a victim. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. Peter missed it. He didn't get the whole counsel of God. He didn't listen to the whole word. Guys, listen, trials, suffering, even the season we're in right now as a church, as a church nationally, the, the coronavirus season of suffering and trial and confusion and wherever you're at today, maybe you've been sick, maybe you're concerned about being sick, maybe a family member has been sick or has even passed away. I know many in the church this has happened and we love you, we're praying for you. But truthfully, we have to understand biblically that the sufferings that we experience are going to lead to something happening in our lives. Jesus is going to talk to the disciples about that in a moment here in the text. And it will result in us resurrecting with a new life in Christ Jesus. That's how it works. It's how God does things. Peter yet didn't understand it. And you'll see how Jesus deals with P P Peter on this. You know, I want to say to you, just because I think Peter gets such a bad rap because he always just takes the step. You know, he always just kind of puts himself out there. He stepped out on the water. He was the one just in the previous verse in Matthew that said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he was right that time. But I think Peter gets a bad rap. You know, think about this. Why would Peter say this? Why would Peter say this? Think about who we're talking about. This is a Jewish man who's grown up in Hebrew school in Israel. And he has learned his entire life that, you know, that the Messiah would be coming and religious Judaism taught him that the Messiah would be a conquering Messiah coming to set up Jerusalem. You know, Peter was, if he was a victim of anything, he was a victim of bad doctrine. Bad Bible teaching, right? Remember when Jesus came on the scene in Bethlehem, they, they knew the scriptures, they knew the prophecies there in Jerusalem, but they wouldn't travel just a few miles to go see if this was truly the Messiah. And they obviously missed Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. 
But this is what Peter had learned, and he's looking at Jesus going, listen, bud, I know you're the Messiah, and I love you, but some of your doctrine is off, man. You think in order to inherit the kingdom, you're going to have to suffer. Boy, do I have some good news for you. If you stick with me, you're not going to have to go to the cross. You're not going to have to suffer to take possession of the things God has for you. And let's see how God in human flesh responds to that idea. Verse 23, look what Jesus says. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, just think about this, almost like a movie. Picture it. Jesus is walking. This is the Son of God. He turns and said to Peter, I got a feeling there was a little bit of a fire in his eyes at this moment, right? He said to Peter, he said, get behind me, Satan. Wow. He said, you are an offense to me. I don't know if God's ever talked to you this way. You don't want to be on the, that end of the, the conversation, right? For you are not mindful of the things of God. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Number two, if you're taking note, listen, it's all about the cross, not just for Jesus Christ, but you're going to see in a moment as we move on in the text, it's all about the cross for you and I as well. Number two is you need to reject the lies of Satan. A child of God, a man or a woman of God, can only go so far in their walk with Jesus if, if they will not learn to reject the lies of Satan. Like, there is not a compromise there. You can't say to the enemy, all right, I'll let these lies come through, but not these. He will always take more ground if you give him any ground. He always will. The only way to deal with the lies of Satan is you have to outright, completely, fully say no. No, you are not welcome in my house. <laughs> no, no, you cannot come in. No, you cannot call me. <laughs> That's how you have to do it with the enemy. You have to outright reject the lies of Satan. And where do we get that example from? Maybe you want to write this down so you can learn it for your own sake. We get that from the person of Jesus Christ. Directly from Jesus, we get this message. Directly from Jesus. You see, did, did Jesus look at Peter, and you remember Jesus was the one who formed Peter in his mother's womb. Did he look at Peter and say, man, I thought I knew you. I thought you were this fisherman that I called, but the whole time you were actually the big bad wolf. You weren't Rob, you know, you weren't uh, grandma, right? And, and all of a sudden Jesus pulls off the veil and there's Satan and he just had a mask on that looked like Peter. No, that's not what happened here. See, what happened was as Peter spoke to Jesus, Jesus recognized the voice he heard. And he knew the voice he heard, it wasn't Peter's voice. How did Jesus recognize the voice? If you're taking note, you could jot it down. Earlier in the book of Matthew, it's when Jesus was being tempted by the devil himself. God, uh, by the Spirit, had taken Jesus away into the wilderness before he began his ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. It says, again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Verse 9, and he said to him, listen, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. You shall serve. Listen, Satan's vessels, right, that he'll use may change, but his lies always stay the same. It's just how it works. In essence, Peter was like a cell phone. And Satan got his hands on Peter and literally, because Satan didn't want to see Jesus face to face. So he got his hands on Peter and he said, Peter, dial Jesus' number. Dial the number. And he took Peter and he spoke through Peter to Jesus. And Jesus knew who he was talking to because he had heard that voice before. Because when he was tempted, Satan said the same thing. It says he showed Jesus, when he brought Jesus on that high mountain in Matthew 3, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. From the beginning of time, Satan, did, you know, they, they, they saw all the kingdoms of the world in that moment of time. And Satan said to Jesus, what did he say? He says, if you bow down to me, I'll give it all to you and you will not have to suffer. Now, what's Peter saying? Jesus tells him about the cross and Peter says, Satan says through Peter, right? I'll, you don't have to suffer, right? You can, if you follow me. Now, a couple things here, if you're taking note, 
And this is why it's so important that we learn to reject the lies of the enemy. The first thing, if you're taking note, number one is Peter did not have the authority to give Jesus what he was offering. And neither does Satan. When Satan makes you a promise, you know how often he keeps his promise? Never. Never. It's, it's the, and if you believe that Satan keeps his promises, listen, I got an island I want to sell you. Just send me an email later on. I'll give you the coordinates, you know. It's not true. Satan does not keep his promises. It's not true. And Peter was walking in an authority that he just didn't have. And Peter is going to have trouble in his life to shake this, to shake this. You know, we have to be careful. We don't listen to the lies of the enemy. And I would say to you, be very careful. As a, if you consider yourself a child of God, a man or a woman of God, be careful. Before you just, you know, blur out your opinions towards people, towards them as a person, be careful of that. Because I don't think any of us want to be used of the enemy. But we see here with Peter, there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity, and we don't want that. But Jesus here deals with Peter and Satan speaking through Peter very decisively and directly. And we do, we have to as well. Let's move on. Verse 24. It says, then Jesus, look at this, said to his disciples. So Jesus deals with Peter. The disciples are looking on going, oh my gosh, I always knew there was something wrong with Peter, right? <laughs> but that's not true. Jesus is going to kind of clarify this and use this opportunity to call them to a closer walk with him. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, if anybody wants to follow me, right? He says, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life, listen, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, man, you will find it. Verse 26, Jesus said, for what profit is it to a man, listen, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For his soul. If you're taking note, it's number three. It, we're talking about how it's all about the cross. Number three is don't let your growth be stunted. Don't let your growth in Christ, your growth in the Lord, even at a time like this when we have a, really a ready-made excuse to say, oh man, I haven't attended church in three months because I couldn't. Don't let your growth be stunted. You know, one of my favorite things to do in life, and it's not even close. Before I was saved, my favorite things in life were, you know, playing sports predominantly, right? Uh, doing those types of things, active things, you know, playing football, playing basketball, playing baseball. But I remember getting saved and then having, getting around a group of people that were actively sharing the gospel, right? Like, I mean, these guys I was with were looking for opportunities to tell people about Jesus, I mean, I've, I've shared some of these stories. I can recall being at graveyards and going, you're not going to walk up to that grieving person and start sharing the gospel. And before you knew it, that's what happened. You know, I was like, nah, that's too much for me. But, I mean, I've watched them lead people to Christ right by a gravesite. I mean, so many stories. And after that, and finally one day, I got the courage to share the gospel with somebody myself. And I shared the gospel. I'll never forget because I shared it. And I was like, all right, I think I did it right. You know, I think I got it. And I'll never forget this person says, I want to receive Jesus. And I remember thinking, oh, man, I haven't, I haven't gotten that far yet. You know, I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm not They're like, no, no, I want to receive Jesus. I was looking around, seeing is there somebody, nobody. So I remember praying the prayer with them. And I remember thinking, I don't even know if this prayer worked. You know, is this the right prayer? Did I get it right? And I'll never forget, I, I mean, I've never shut my eyes that hard in my life. And when I opened my eyes, the person was crying. And I said, whew, nothing like this. You know, there is, isn't, isn't nothing like that. Getting to bring somebody into the kingdom, knowing what God's done in your life that God's going to do in their life. But can I say, as exciting that as, as it is, that is not the end. What is it? That's just the beginning. You know, just the beginning it's just the beginning. That's just the start of it. It's just the beginning of following Jesus. We just entered in and we're going, oh. it's like when you walk into a store, and I know you probably haven't walked into too many stores lately, but the next time you do, you know, the, you, you step on it and the doors open and it goes, I mean, it's going to kind of be exciting the next time we can actually walk into a retail store other than Walmart or Target. Can I get an amen, you know, and shop right? It's like, oh my gosh, I forgot, you know. 
but uh, all joking aside, we're just entering in when you're saved. If you've received Christ over this coronavirus season through these live streams, listen, it's just the beginning. And Jesus here is saying, it's just the beginning, guys. You think it's exciting now, you don't even know what's about to happen. It's going to be so exciting, so wonderful. You know, and it's important we understand this because Jesus is presenting to his disciples here two approaches to life. You know, as you enter in and you're now saved, there are two approaches to life. And I'm going to tell you this, God will never overwrite your code on, but without your, your permission. You have two choices how you're going to approach this life. And that's what Jesus says. The approaches are to deny yourself or to put yourself first. Two different approaches. Jesus said there's two approaches to life. You know, the two approaches, you can either take up your cross or you can ignore the cross, right? You can ignore what Jesus did on the cross. You can follow Christ, you can follow Christ, or you can follow the world. Those are two choices. These are two totally separate and distinct approaches to life. Whether you call yourself Christian or not Christian, whether you consider yourself to be religious or not religious, at the end of the day, where the rubber meets the road is here, the approach we take to life. You can either lose your life for Jesus' sake or you can save your life for your own sake. These are the approaches, Jesus says. You can either keep your soul, Jesus said, or you can choose to lose your soul. These are two very different approaches. Very different. And there's a, there's a danger to think that just because I've said yes to Jesus, I'm automatically going to become one that chooses the cross that chooses to live my life for God's glory and not my own. It doesn't work that way. It's not how it works. You have to make choices. I have to make choices. Each day, we have to make choices. And Jesus here says in the text, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So these two approaches to life have consequences, either for the good or for the bad. And Jesus here is basically telling his disciples, listen, guys, don't get confused. What I desire to build up more than anything else in you, it's not your portfolio financially. It's not your body physically, right? It's not your mind intellectually. What I want to make well more than anything else is your soul. That's what I want. Right? Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 11, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He says, I will give you rest. And then he says in that text, he says, you know, for I am meek and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. Your soul. You know, there's an interesting area of scripture. You could jot it down. Genesis chapter 14. Uh, the specific verse is verse 21, but it's there that uh, Abraham, when he went to obey the Lord, his nephew Lot came with him. Um, and as time went on, they were both blessed so abundantly that their servants started to have friction. So Abraham told Lot, he said, listen, wherever you want to go, you go. You know, Abraham understood it. In order to please God, I only have to do two things. And a little secret here. To please God, you only have to do two things. Number one, you got to believe him. Number two, you have to trust him. And they're both basically the same thing. So, and that's it. You believe God. You wake up tomorrow and you go, I don't care what's going on. I believe you, God, and I trust you. He goes, all right, we got ourselves an adventure today. And Abraham did that, so he knew it doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter. God's going to bless it. It's going to be fine, right? Lot, he says, so Lot went and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Abraham went in a different direction. And what happened there was as time went on, because Sodom and Gomorrah, he was associated with the world too closely that the world had its own conflicts. And because Lot was so closely connected to the world, he was swept up in the world. And he got taken captive by these armies that came against Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the cool thing is, uh, one of my favorite areas of scriptures, you know, we think of Abraham like this, this old man with like a, you know, like a walker, like he could barely stand. The Bible says Abraham went, got his servants... They got on their horses, they rode, and they, they literally defeated multiple armies by themselves. It's like the beginning of the army rangers or the Navy SEALs, special forces. I mean, and, but who was it? It was General Abraham. So if you get to heaven, you think, oh, let me find Abraham. He's going to be the old cripple. You got the wrong guy. He might, he might pop you one. I would be careful. You know, he was a tough dude. You know, just because he believed God didn't make him, you know, less strong. Well, after they set him free and now 
Lot and his people are free, his family is free, and so is Sodom and the king of Sodom. As they're there waiting, the Bible gives us this picture of this, this Melchizedek, which is a whole other Bible study, amazing Old Testament Christophany. But after that, the king of Sodom approaches Abraham now. And it's, almost, it's interesting because the king of Sodom was, was actually, in Abraham's mind, just another one of the captives. But in the king of Sodom's mind, he would posture himself like he had you know, this authority. And he comes and he's like, listen, here's, we're going to make a deal. Abraham's probably looking going, oh, no deal from you. And this is what the king of Sodom said to Abraham. He says, listen, you take all the stuff from the battle. I want the people. This is what the world misses. This is what often the church misses. Jesus says the most precious part of a man is his soul. And if you let God make your soul healthy, if you let him heal your soul, no matter what you've gone through, if you've gone through just pain that human beings were not made to go through because of the sin in this world, Jesus Christ can restore your soul. He can do it. I've seen it done. It's happened in my life. It's happened in so many. That's what he's after. If you let him restore your soul, everything else will begin to fall into place. It will. And you know who else knows that truly? He'll never let you know that, but Satan really knows that. Ultimately, what Satan's after, he's, he's going to point you to the material realm. He's going to point you to the, you know, the, the spiritual, you know, you know, everybody has these spirit guides now and Eastern meditation, all these things. But what he's really after is the soul of man. He's after the core of us. But Jesus said, listen, I'm going to be the one that causes you to grow. I'm going to be the one that changes you. So Jesus calls us to this. And he says, what does it profit a man if you go in the whole world but forfeit your soul? Verse 27, it says, for the son of man, for the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels. It says, and then he will reward each according to his works. It's amazing what Jesus does here in response to Peter's foolishness. In response to Peter walking in the flesh, guys, and allowing Satan to speak to Jesus through him, he's supposed to be one of Jesus' closest friends and confidants, and he allows Satan to try to deter the plans of God through his life. Jesus doesn't allow that to discourage him. He uses it as a platform to minister to his disciples and then to even point them towards heaven. He says, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. It says, and then he will reward each according to his works. Jesus says, listen, Peter, you're being used to Satan, but disciples, listen, the life that God is calling you to, follow my example, is a life where you lay down your life for others, where you take up your cross. And then Jesus tells him here in the text, and when I return in the clouds... Right, Peter? He's trying to put Peter in his place. He's trying to let Peter understand, bud, you're, you're, you're past your skis here, man. You're taking authority upon yourself that, that God has not given you. You're not staying in, in, in order, right? In that spiritual military formation. Listen, when Jesus told the disciples, you know, and he sent them out, the disciples went out. There was authority. That's how Jesus functioned. And Jesus now is telling the disciples, listen, I'm under authority too. When I come on the clouds because my Father sends me, he says there in verse 27, then he will reward each according to his works. You know, there's two approaches to life, church. But can I tell you this? It's all about the cross. If you only listen to the first part, if you're going through a time of suffering and all you're doing is focusing on your suffering, on your pain. This is what I'm going through. If you're not listening to the word, if you're not listening to the Lord, what's going to happen is you're going to miss him say to you, listen, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through a trial. And a part of you is even going to die. And you go, no, that's my favorite part. And Jesus says, yeah, but that's the part that I have to kill in order to raise you from the dead and use you like I want to use you. That's the part. You know, I remember getting saved you know, just following the Lord, beginning to share the gospel, reading my Bible, beginning to say, you know, the old lifestyle, the old person I was, I want to leave that in the watery gate, grave of baptism. I want to go on with Jesus. And I still remember to this day, kind of the progression, you know, and, and 
just how God did that in me. And it, it ended up, I was working actually at a Christian summer camp. And I don't know how many of you guys have ever been around a Christian summer camp. And it was a sleepaway camp. You're going, it almost sounds negative. Listen, if you are working at a Christian sleepaway summer camp, it is tough stuff. I'm telling you, you're going, oh, you need to laugh. I'm telling you, it was exhausting. You know, you are literally with these kids every second of the day, right? Every second. You know, you think, all right, I'm with them all day. You go home and rest. No, no, no. After you're with them during the day, now you got to see them all night. I love them. Listen, don't misunderstand me. When I see some of these kids in heaven, I'm not going to run the other way, possibly. But I'll never forget. It was like, oh, finally. Somebody, no, there's no rest. I mean, you know, at nighttime, you go to put them to bed. These kids, they all want to stay up. You're, you know, you're trying to not, you know, saying, Lord Jesus, send the archangel Gabriel, Lord. And Michael, you know, you're just going, I got to get this. It was exhausting. And I just remember the Lord just killing something in me that year, that summer. Just killing this, this thing in me. Just really creating me and breaking me, you know. Just breaking me down and teaching me, you know, he who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. Jesus just ministering to me through that time that I want to use you, but I use servants. That's how I do my work. You're going to either take two approaches. You're going to take approach for your glory, your fame, or you're going to take approach of taking up the cross, and it's going to lead to God getting all the credit. And people, after they leave, saying, wow, Jesus. But we have to go through that, just like Peter had to learn this, and the disciples had to learn this. Suffering, there would be trials, and a part of you would have to die. But if you go through that process, Jesus says, and I will rise again. I will rise again. There will be a new life in you. I believe, I believe this wholeheartedly, that if God's purposes are accomplished in this season of the church, as we are going through a trial, as there is fear and anxiety, as the psalmist would say, on every side, right? There's division. I think we're more divided as a nation. It's hard to say this. It's very hard. Because it's hard to believe that we could be any more divided now than we were before the coronavirus. Because I thought, wow, this nation is so divided. I would pray to the Lord. But I feel like we're even more divided now. Unfortunately, racially, it's sad. Divided politically, right? It's very sad. It's dangerous. But listen, as the church... We have to get our marching orders, not from Peter, but from Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus say to us? He says, listen, you're going to suffer a little while. You're going to die. There's a part of you that's going to have to die, right? I mean, listen, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I've had to really go between my two citizenships this last season. You're going, well, you're a citizen of another country? Yeah, I am. I'm a citizen of the United States, and I'm a citizen of heaven. That's right. Paul the Apostle said in Philippians, he says, for my citizenship is in heaven. And I really had to say, you know, the Lord's brought me to the place where he's like, you know, that's your primary citizenship is heaven, right? heaven. And I believe if we go through this season the way Jesus wants us to, we're going to come out on the other side and there is going to be, and this is, I believe this is God's plan. I believe this is what the Lord by his spirit has been speaking to me, is that we come on the other side, there's going to be a resurrection life among us. It's going to be among us. Now, the only way to have that resurrection life is we have to go through the cross. Right? Jesus said, if you would come after me, you must take up your cross and follow me. That has to happen. We have to go through that. You know, some of us, we may be in the middle of trial right now. And you might be like Peter looking at Jesus going, why are you doing this? Why do I have to go through this? There's no purpose in this. There's no plan in this. And Jesus is going, son, daughter, stay with me. I was taking you through this. Sometimes I think God, and he's so gentle, you know, he is gentle with us because he knows it takes time. But sometimes Sometimes I think the Spirit of God is whispering in our ear, it's taking longer because of you. You know, I don't know if your kids have ever done this, but when, you know, our youngest, Selah, she is great in so many ways, at so many things. And one thing she's great at is getting her own way. She is great at it, you know. I mean, one of the best I've ever seen. Honestly, including adults. I'm not kidding. 
But I mean, she has this way that when she really wants to do something and you're holding her hand and I don't know if you had this with your kids, but she gets the limp body syndrome, you know, it's all of a sudden just limp. And she's there now, good thing she only weighs about two ounces, you know. But she's just limp. You know, even for me, and I'm a pretty tough cookie, you know. Even for me, I still go, oh. And what she doesn't realize is daddy's taking you a place to bless you. You're missing it. And by doing this, you're not getting there quicker. <laughs> you're, you're making the process longer, you know. And I'm not going to leave you. You know, it's not like I go, that's it, you know. Get off, get away from me. You know, shake her hand loose and that's it. We'll see you, you know, when you're an adult. We'll drive back to the neighborhood and find you one day, you know. It's not going to happen. But I have to slow down, right? You know, the key to life, it's all about the cross, man. It's going through. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. We, not only do we have two citizenships, you know what else? We have two bank accounts. We have an earthly bank account. Some of yours, you may be getting nervous because it's not, it's not looking too good. But you have a heavenly bank account. As we serve the Lord, there are literal, literal rewards in heaven that are going to matter to us. They are going to matter to you and to me, and they, they do matter. And Jesus says there, verse 28, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. We're, we're going to see that next week on the Mount of Transfiguration. We're going to see Jesus uh, almost a, a trailer, right? A trailer for a movie where you get the best highlights of the movie all packed into three to five minutes, right? We're going to see a trailer of Jesus in His coming kingdom. He's going to show it to Peter, James, and John on the mountain. But listen, before we see Jesus in His m metamorphosized, transfigured, what we see is that we have to die. You know, that revelation, that reality, you know, the power of the Spirit. If you're listening today and you go, man, I really want my wife to be saved. I want my, my, my husband to be saved. I want my son or my daughter to be saved. Listen, here at Calvary, I, we have watched people come to know Christ. We've watched them tap into the person of Jesus Christ. And we've watched as the life of Jesus, and they suffer a part of them dies, and then the resurrection power starts to flow through them. And you know what ends up happening? Guess what? A good tree begins to what? Bear good fruit. People start to get saved. It starts to happen. God wants to do that in your life more than you do. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to close here. But I do want to ask you today, 